Welcome everyone to today's Glycomet webinar presentation. Our first presentation is from Dr. David Kwong. Uh, David and I have actually known each other for quite a while because we actually had the same postdoc supervisor, Dr. Steve Witherson at UBC. Of course, we were spaced out a little bit in, in time. Uh, but David is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Concordia University. And his lab is developing uh, some really cool uh, methods for discovering drugs that can block enzymes involved in pathogenesis and things like metas uh, metastasis uh, within cancer cells. And he's going to tell us today about some, some work that's sort of near and dear to, to my research interests, and that is how do we go about inhibiting glycosyl transferases. And so without further ado, uh, David, go ahead. Thanks everybody for joining us to listen to some of the work that's going on in my lab at Concordia, and we're working on uh, tools uh, to probe and inhibit uh, some cellular glycosyl transferases. Um, but before I get into that topic, if you'll indulge me, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about some of the other research topics that are going on in my lab. So obviously a large focus of uh, our lab's research is on glycobiology and carbohydrate active enzymes, but this is not an exclusive uh, topic of research in our lab. So we sort of have uh, two overlapping focuses uh, in addition to glycobiology. We're also generally interested in studying uh, the function and engineering of enzymes and enzyme pathways. So a couple of examples. Uh, this work includes uh, work on metabolic engineering uh, in, in a larger project I'm collaborating with uh, other groups uh, to engineer yeast producing, uh, to produce building blocks for polymers, other useful chemicals, um, starting from biomass. We're interested in doing directed evolution of, of protein biosensors to, uh, to, um, to measure and optimize um, these uh, metabolically engineered yeast, detect the different intermediates in these pathways. Other projects we're interested in, uh, we're looking at engineering biocatalysts, enzyme biocatalysts through directed evolution uh, to produce biofuels and biorenewables. And getting more into the glycobiology space, uh, we have projects we're interested in looking at the biosynthetic enzymes um, involved in the biosynthesis of natural products, secondary metabolites, microbial secondary metabolites that are uh, glycosylated natural products. And um, um, my student, Iftiha Mohideen, uh, she will be presenting uh, some of this work uh, in, uh, in a later episode of this, uh, this season of uh, Glyconet webinars. Um, and the topic of today's talk is more on our efforts in targeting and manipulating uh, cell surface carbohydrate active enzymes uh, towards therapeutic, pro uh, therapeutic applications. And this uh, Along this line, we're moving towards using these, uh, targeting these enzymes and using these tools that we're developing uh, towards glycoengineering, uh, for example, um, glycoprotein biologics or uh, glycoengineering cell surfaces for cell therapies. So uh, a lot of projects where we're looking at the processes um, and the enzymes that assemble uh, bioactive carbohydrates from sugar building blocks, as well as those that modify them and break them down. Um, and these days, uh, we're focused on the enzymes that assemble cell surface glycans that are important in human health and disease. And so we have developed a set of tools to probe their activity and where appropriate uh, determine how to inhibit them where they're involved in disease. And so a major example of how uh, gly glycans and glycosylation can be involved in disease is of course uh, in cancer. Glycosylation has a big role in cancer and shown here uh, in this slide uh, is a figure uh, from a review on this topic uh, from 2015. And it shows here um, the different roles of, of glycosylation in cancer. And I don't have to tell this audience uh, that um, cell surface carbohydrates uh, make up a very important mode of uh, communication, intercellular communication. 
uh, between cells. And of course, in normal healthy biological uh, processes, proper communication of this uh, sugar encoded information is vital. Um, whereas miscommunication of this information can have adverse health effects uh, and can cause pathology. Of course, cancer is an excellent example of this. Uh, cancer can hijack these carbohydrate signals and exploit uh, receptors um, that are vulnerable to this kind of misdirection or this kind of uh, disinformation. And of course, um, abnormal glycosylation is, is present. It's a hallmark in essentially all types of cancers uh, where, it's, um, where it's very important uh, in its use in diagnosis as a clinical diagnostic. But uh, these abnormal glycosylation patterns are also a very important driver for cancer. It's important for uh, uh, cancer proliferation. Yet uh, the pathways that lead to this um, abnormal glycosylation, lead to abnormal glycosylation patterns in cancer are sort of um, understudied. They're not very well studied as, as therapeutic targets. And, and uh, part of our, our research is, is, is hoping to try to address that. Uh, so for the first part of uh, my talk, I'm going to talk about this in the context of a, a specific uh, carbohydrate interaction involving Lewis X, this tetrasaccharide here. And uh, this is involved in circulating tumor cells uh, where they, this interaction uh, with Lewis X and receptors um, can can allow for uh, these tumor cells to interact with endothelial cells and uh, start secondary tumor sites through metastasis. And so this involves Silo-Lewis X. Again, this is a tetrasaccharide. Uh, it's a silylated, fucosylated glycan, has a silic acid and a fucose uh, unit here. Uh, this is the structure. I can also show this in the sort of standard notation um, to be easier on the eyes. Uh, and again, this is, in addition to, to its role in cancer, it it's, has, has very important uh, functions in normal biology. It's involved in many different cell-cell interactions. Uh, one example is in human fertilization. Uh, the egg is coated in sugars, which include Lewis X, and these are recognized by receptor proteins on the sperm cell. Uh, another example of where Lewis X is involved is in the, the, the homing of leukocytes, that is uh, white blood cells, uh, to sites of inflammation in the immune response. So you, you have these, uh, these uh, glycans on the surface of white blood cells uh, interacting with uh, selectin proteins on endoth endothelial cells, uh, resulting in a sort of rolling adhesion. Uh, until these leukocytes uh, stop and interact more tightly uh, through integrin-mediated interactions, uh, which is the first step in, uh, in the exit of these, these uh, white blood cells from the bloodstreams through extravasation into the tissue uh, in sites of inflammation. So cancer cells, for example, also uh, exploit the same kind of mechanism. Um, in many cancers, you have an abnormal abundance of uh, Silo-Lewis X on, on these tumor cells. These circulating tumor cells can then bind to endothelial tissue in the bloodstream through these, um, through these uh, carbohydrate protein interactions and uh, invade uh, and cause tumors at secondary sites. So uh, our question is, can we, can we target this process, uh, the assembly of these, these carbohydrates on, on cancer cells uh, as a potential therapeutic? And so um, the assembly of uh, this glycan Lewis X on cell surfaces um, involves uh, several enzymatic steps. And we wanna see, can we target these enzymes? Can we target the glycosyltransferase enzymes that assemble Lewis X? This is uh, assembled from uh, a precursor, common N-acetyllactosamine, lacnac precursor, common on, on cell surfaces. And it involves uh, both the silylation and uh, fucosylation by um, enzymes in the Golgi. 
a silo transferase and a fucosyl transferase. And, and in our work, we're looking at uh, the fucosyl transferase um, uh, enzyme. Uh, again, this is active in, in the Golgi. And uh, we want to see uh, if we can uh, target this for inhibition. We want to see if we can devise a way to identify inhibitors to uh, these glycosyl transferase enzymes, well, looking first at fucosyl transferase. So uh, to do this, if we're going to screen a large, um, large libraries of compounds, we need a high throughput glycosyl transferase assay. And so therein lies our challenge. How do we develop a high throughput assay to detect uh, glycosyl transferase activity? So um, for glycosyl transferases, uh, we're forming glycoside bonds and the formation of glycoside bonds doesn't really produce a conveniently measurable signal for an assay. Uh, so it's not, not, not so easy to assay, not as easy uh, as say assaying for glycoside hydrolase activity. Uh, for glycoside hydrolases, uh, you could use a chromogenic or fluorogenic substrate uh, that releases a, uh, a reporter group upon hydrolysis. Uh, if uh, this glycosidase recognizes an oligosaccharide as a substrate, you might need to couple this to subsequent glycosidases uh, that completely cleave it and release a fluorescent reporter group. Uh, but how do we how do we assay for uh, glycosyl transferases? Our solution is to use the same strategy uh, for, as, as for glycoside hydrolases, illustrated here, with some modifications. Uh, so in this example, assaying for glycosidase activity, uh, this is done with, coupled, with a coupled enzyme uh, reaction, and each of these enzymes is specific. So this, in this example, this is uh, galactosidase, it recognizes this oligosaccharide, it's specific, cleaves that uh, terminal sugar, and this coupled enzyme here, this N-acetylhexosaminidase, only acts to cleave this bond, uh, cleaving off this um, N-acetyl, um, uh, this gluconac, after the galactose has been cleaved. So if this substrate, this fluorogenic probe, which consists of uh, an oligosaccharide, disaccharide in this case, if this is also a substrate for a glycosyl transferase, in this example, a fucosyl transferase, modification of this probe uh, will result in a structure that's no longer recognized by these glycosidase enzymes. So we could, if we, if we carry this out, if, if we carry out these reactions sort of sequentially, we can assay for activity because uh, after conversion of this probe into this uh, fucosylated um, uh, glycoside, uh, we won't get any, we, we'll get less fluorescence in the subsequent um, glycosidase reaction because uh, more of this starting material has been uh, consumed. So we can assay for activity in that way, but we can also assay for inhibition because if we include an inhibitor in our initial uh, glycosyl transferase reaction, then we can recapitulate. Um, we can recapitulate the fluorescence, and so uh, this work was spearheaded by my former postdoc, Dr. Xiaowa Zhang, and uh, I won't go into too much of the detail of this uh, for this presentation. Uh, we had published this work last year, and I also presented it uh, in in Banff last year, uh, but. Quickly to just recap the strategy to carry out this assay, um, a few conditions have to be met. Uh, we need to have a fluorogenic substrate that's uh, recognized by uh, glycosidase enzymes. In, in our example here, we have uh, uh, methyl umbuliferol uh, beta N acetyl lactosamine, or MU lacnac for short. And this is recognized by uh, BGAA, a galactosidase and SP-hex and N-acetylhexosaminidase. And this should release uh, fluorescence. So next, the, the probe, the mu beta lacnac in this case, it should also be a substrate for uh, the fucosyl transferase. And finally, this fucosylated product should not be a substrate for those two glycosidases. Um, 
And if those conditions are met, uh, then we can assay for the inhibition of fucosylation, like this. So this will recapitulate a fluorescent signal. And uh, using this approach, skipping over the details, uh, we had synthesized uh, MU beta lacnac as a probe, and we had determined that yes, it is a substrate for those uh, glycosidase enzymes, and it is a substrate for the fucosyl transferase, um, fucosyl transferase 6, or, or FUT6 for short, which is involved in the assembly of uh, Silo Lewis X on uh, cell surfaces. And we had determined that the fucosylated product is not recognized by those uh, glycosidases. Um, so uh, you can distinguish these um, um, on that basis uh, de uh, uh, by detection of, uh, of cleavage uh, through fluorescence. And so we can carry out this fucosyl transferase reaction in the presence of a potential inhibitor. And first, we tested this compound, uh, this compound here, which was described in the literature as, a, as an inhibitor of FUT6. And we did see a dose-dependent inhibition uh, using the assay strategy that I had just described. And so next, we synthesized, or I should say my medicinal chemist uh, colleagues synthesized a small collection of uh, derivatives, and we screened these for inhibition. We did this in high throughput uh, on 384 well plates, um, screening these compounds in different concentrations, and uh, we were able to uh, do this all on, all on one plate uh, to get, um, to do these assays in high throughput to get inhibition um, IC50 constants. And so this wasn't a very diverse set of compounds. We only have uh, 13 compounds here, and they're not very different from one another. Uh, but we do see, uh, what, we, what we did see was that we could determine the IC50 values uh, against uh, the FUT6 enzyme for these compounds. Um, they're nothing to write home about. These compounds are sort of mid, uh, mid micromolar inhibitors. They, they're, they they're, wouldn't be very good drugs at this point uh, without further development. But what we did demonstrate is that we can see which compounds are better inhibitors. And of course, we can distinguish uh, inhibitors from non-inhibitors. Uh, this, this compound here was a control compound. Uh, doesn't inhibit uh, FUT6 at all. So this, this was just a sort of example, a small uh, kind of uh, toy example, showing that we can screen a small collection of molecules as a, as a sort of proof of concept. And uh, um, with this, we established that we can do this in high throughput in microtiter plates. So we can, in principle, use this as a screen uh, to, to look at uh, larger, coll larger collections of compounds. And so, uh, with that initial work, uh, we had developed a sensitive high throughput uh, assay for glycosyl transferase, glycosyl transferase activity and inhibition. Um, we demonstrated this just with a small, a focused uh, library of, of derivatives from a, um, a derived from a known inhibitor. And um, we showed that this works. Uh, we envisioned that further screening can be done on larger collections of small molecules. And uh, our, our aim is to broaden this strategy uh, to target other glycosyl transferase enzymes. And so I'll give another example of, of this. Uh, if we pull back again to this slide looking at uh, glycosylation in, in cancer, you can see again there are many different ways in which uh, glycosylation can affect cancer progression. There are lots of potential targets. Another example um, of how glycosylation can, can be involved in, in, uh, in cancer signaling is the effect of uh, abnormal glycosylation on the function of uh, receptor proteins and other proteins. So glycosylation patterns can influence the activity of certain uh, receptors and amplify or modulate uh, signal transduction. This could have downstream effects uh, that are important in cancer regulation. And um, a lot of these proteins, uh, many of which are, um, are receptors, are N-glycosylated, and modifications to this 
to these N glycans can be important uh, in disease. And one example here I have is, uh, is this protein, this receptor protein uh, transformation, fac transformation growth factor beta receptor. Uh, this protein is post-translationally modified with uh, this N-glycan. And this N-glycan could be further modified by core fucosylation. And in effect, this core fucosylation activates this receptor. So normally, uh, the TGF beta receptor should respond to transformation growth factor uh, beta. Um, it, uh, its responsiveness depends on, uh, on activation by core fucosylation. So um, activation uh, by core fucosylation makes this receptor uh, more responsive to this particular growth factor. And in some cancers, the response to this growth factor promotes um, tumor cell migration um, and metastasis by promoting uh, this epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT. So what EMT does is uh, if you have sort of this, uh, this initial primary tumor cell, localized uh, carcinoma, this is just stationary, this undergoes uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. These cells sort of de-differentiate, break through the basement membrane, and enter the bloodstream through intravasation, uh, move along through circulation, and then through extravasation, exiting of the, of the bloodstream, which involves other uh, glycan interactions we discussed before. This can invade and metastasize into secondary tumor sites. So. Uh, this is one, one role in which uh, core fucosylation can be important. Another example is where, where core fucosylation of N-glycans is important includes um, antibodies. So in immunotherapies, you can use cancer-targeting antibodies to, target, uh, to specifically target cancer cells and signal uh, to the immune system to kill those cancer cells. And these antibodies themselves are glycoproteins. Um, which are modified by these N-glycans, uh, which these, these N-glycans can be core fucosylated or not. And so these cancer targeting antibodies function by recognizing cancer specific antigens. Uh, they, can they can recruit uh, natural killer cells, which then in turn release cytotoxins, killing the cancer cells and the effectiveness of this process, which is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, uh, depends on how well these antibodies can recruit uh, the natural killer cells, which uh, is uh, dependent on the um, um, affinity of these receptors on natural killer cells to the, uh, the FC domain on these therapeutic antibodies. And it just so happens that uh, antibodies without core fucosylation on these on these N-glycans are better at uh, antibody dependent antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So um, normally these antibodies are produced in cell culture, and and the idea is if we can discover inhibitors, um, they could also be useful as tools um, as agents for modulating. Um, a glycosylation of these uh, glycoproteins. And um, we can use these as tools for glycoengineering um, uh, therapeutic antibodies and other glycoprotein uh, biologics. So the enzyme that catalyzes core fucosylation uh, on N glycans is FUT8. Uh, FUT8 acts in the Golgi at a particular stage in N glycan maturation. And its preferred substrate is this, uh, this, this uh, heptasaccharide complex glycan. And so if we want to carry out the strategy I had described uh, for screening inhibitors for glycosyltransferases, um, we want to apply that against uh, FUT8, then we need the, an appropriate substrate probe, uh, which would consist of that heptasaccharide in a glycoside linkage with a reporter group that gives a signal on, on, on hydrolysis. So 
like a methyl like a methyl imbolipheral group. So uh, the probe should not only be a substrate for FUT8, but it should also be a substrate for glycosidase, for a glycosidase that uh, cleaves it and releases fluorescence. But uh, the modified fucosylated probe should not be cleaved. And so the challenge uh, here is to produce this probe. Uh, this was a challenge that was uh, tackled by my master student, uh, Max Sirocco. And what I'm going to show you is work that we had published uh, just uh, earlier this year uh, in May uh, in biochemistry. And so we, we had a recipe for this. Uh, and our recipe starts with a few dozen eggs. We took advantage of the fact that um, we can isolate sialoglycopeptide from chicken egg yolk. Uh, this uh, sialoglycopeptide is an undex, an undecasaccharide, has 11 sugar units. It's linked to a hexapeptide, uh, six amino acid, six amino acids, uh, and the extraction and purification of this compound is described in the literature. It's relatively straightforward, um, starting from egg yolks or egg yolk powder, uh, which is available as a consumer product, as a kitchen supply. You can get lots of this. And you can produce uh, lots of this. You can um, you can uh, extract lots of this compound. And so we're sort of combining uh, chemistry and biology and cuisine here. So with this sialoglycopeptide starting material, again uh, a reminder: we're just interested in this part as a substrate for fucate, this heptasaccharide part. The first part of our synthesis, uh, we want to replace this peptide portion with a fluorogenic methyl umbiliferal group. And we do this using an engineered glycosidase enzyme. Uh, it's a mutant of the enzyme endo-M, which normally uh, cleaves uh, here hydrolytically, cleaves this, this, uh, this bond here. But instead, uh, we're using the mutant enzyme, a, a glycosynthase mutant, uh, to carry out a transglycosidation uh, trans reaction um, to replace this, uh, this portion here with this uh, monosaccharide with a methyl and proliferal group. And the way that this works is that here's the wild type, the, the mechanism of the wild type enzyme. It involves a two step mechanism uh, where, um, in the hydrolysis, where first this bond is cleaved to form this intermediate, which could go on, uh, uh, could react with water to complete the hydrolysis, or it could react with a different uh, um, molecule with a, a terminal sugar group uh, to carry out the transglycosidation reaction. But um, if you're carrying out this reaction in, in water, uh, this, this, the, the hydrolysis usually uh, wins out, outcompetes this transglycosidation. But if you use a mutant enzyme where we've replaced the, the catal this catalytic residue with an, uh, an alanine, um, this, this is uh, the residue that is involved in the formation of this intermediate and uh, also the, the uh, subsequent um, catalyzes a subsequent attack um, by water. If we mutate this, then the, the um, formation of this intermediate and, and uh, the second step is slow, whereas uh, the transglycosidation reaction is favored. And so we can use this to our advantage, use this mutant enzyme to, to uh, basically swap out this, this um, uh, glycopeptide portion for this um, this uh, methyl umbiliferal glycos um, glycoside portion, uh, giving us this molecule here. And uh, we can trim off the parts that we don't need, these excess sugars with glycosidases, um, to give us our probe. Uh, this is the uh, MUG0 probe. And I should say that this is all done in uh, uh, one pot multi-step reaction, and we can purify this with one chromat chromatographic step. So our plan is to use this probe uh, with this strategy. 
uh, to assay inhibition of FUT8. Um, this should be a substrate for the transferase and the hydrolytic uh, glycosidase. We're using chitinase here, which recognizes this diacetyl chitobios unit. But if this is modified by a fucose, uh, this wouldn't be recognized. And so we should be able to distinguish uh, fucosylated from non-fucosylated um, with a non-fucosylated probe uh, getting cleaved and releasing fluorescence. So, uh, we want to first make sure that uh, indeed this is a substrate for FUT8. Uh, normally FUT8 acts on, a, uh, on this glycan attached to a protein, but we want to see if it acts on this probe with this artificial um, reporter group. So we did detection by HPLC-MS, uh, and this is uh, a fixed time, different concentrations of FUT8. We do see conversion of the starting material into the fucosylated product. Um, and then we want to see, can we distinguish these two things? Uh, next, we treat with chitinase. We see only the starting material is hydrolyzed to release a fluorescence. Uh, we see, you can see by HPLC that all of the uh, starting probe, MUG0, is, is consumed and it's replaced. Uh, in its place, we see uh, methyl umbiliferol by HPLC-MS. Uh, we see that the, the fucosylated product remains intact. It's still there. Uh, but we can all, so we're, we're, we're detecting this by HPLC-MS, but we can also see this by fluorescence. Uh, so obviously we, we can use fluorescence as an easy measure uh, for this activity. And we can see that the fluorescence and HPLC-MS detection um, agree quite well. And so uh, that illustrates that we can detect activity, but we want to use this as an inhibition assay. Uh, we didn't test a library of compounds to, to uh, test this, but we use the fact that uh, FUT8 is known to be feedback inhibited by GDP. And so we tested inhibition, the inhibition assay using exogenously added G, uh, GDP. And so this inhibits the enzyme, uh, and so we should get more fluorescence from the subsequent glycosidase, uh, uh, hydrolytic uh, glycosidase step. Uh, we saw that with increasing GDP um, in the initial transferase reaction, uh, we, we do get more inhibition that's detected by fluorescence from the subsequent um, hydrolytic reaction. And so we got an IC50 that is in agreement with literature. Um, and this demonstrates that we can measure inhibition of FUT8 using our strategy, which is good. Um, one major advantage of our uh, fluorescence-based assay is that it's very sensitive, but not only is it very sensitive, it's also very specific. So in previous examples, um, I showed experiments with purified enzymes, uh, recombinant enzymes, uh, but we've also demonstrated in some experiments that I'm gonna show you that uh, we can do this with complex samples uh, and uh, mixtures, for example, in tissue and cell lysine. So, uh, before I, before I go into that, it's worthwhile to point out that there are alternative methods for assaying glycosyltransferases that are much less specific. Um, and this involves the detection by release, uh, by detecting the released nucleotides through coupled assays. But this is not appropriate for complex mixtures uh, because background contaminants uh, can result in high background signal. Um, in our case, the change in fluorescence is, um, is, is dependent on this fucosylation. Uh, the modification of this probe um, uh, by a fucosyl transferase. And so this is very specific. And so to illustrate this, we, we did uh, assays with tissue cell lysate um, from pig liver. So I picked up a, a pig liver from the butcher at uh, our local Asian supermarket where they sell every part of the animal. We homogenize some of this tissue to carry out our assay. Uh, we do see that we, we can detect activity by decreasing uh, fluorescence that's not seen in the controls uh, with no lysate, no, no uh, donor substrate, or um, uh, in the presence of inhibitor. We see a dose-dependent um, activity. Um, and so for these assays, uh, I, I used only, uh, I, I needed only a, a, a gram of, uh, of tissue 
lysate. So I was left with about a pound of, of, uh, of liver that I had to do something with. So I had to uh, figure out how to, how to dispose of this. Uh, liver is not usually something I eat, uh, but I, I tried a few different recipes. I tried it with fava beans. Uh, that was okay. Would have been nicer with uh, uh, some Chianti. Um, but um, I did find a recipe that was not bad. Uh, this is uh, fried pig liver with um, with uh, some scrambled eggs. And so with that recipe, I was able to use the the liver and the egg whites uh, left over from our from our glycan extraction. So nothing went to waste. Um, so I, I think uh, um, that's where I'll leave it off here. Uh, what's next? Uh, we've built these tools. We want to uh, screen inhibitors for, uh, for glycosyltransferases. We've demonstrated we can do this. Um, uh, we're generalizing the strategy uh, for um, broadly towards glycosyltransferases. Uh, we want to use these um, probes, these tools, to screen larger collections of libraries. And um, eventually, we want to develop these inhibitors into therapeutics uh, or as tools for, um, for uh, producing glycoengineered uh, biologics, such as therapeutic antibodies. And with that, I'll end there and most importantly, thank the people who were involved in this work. Um, this is a picture of uh, my lab. This is an old picture of my lab. Um, but uh, most of the work that I described today uh, was done by my former postdoc, Xiaowa Zhang and uh, my master's student, uh, Max Sirocco. Uh, this was facilitated by our collaborators, uh, both uh, here in Canada and also internationally. And also, of course, this work was, uh, was supported by public funds uh, granted to us by these agencies. So I thank them as well. And uh, thank, I thank you for listening. Um, be happy for any questions.